Hello everyone, I'm Michael Abadi. I'm the uh, chairman of the board here at Orca Media. And uh, we just had a board meeting and learned uh, that the Supreme Court of the United States is taking up a um, public access television court case. It's actually the first case that the newly constituted Supreme Court with Kavanaugh chose to um, to hear, and uh, it's a fascinating case. And by great fortune, Dee Dee Halleck happens to be in Vermont. Um, she has ties to this state. Uh, she's in New York City most of the time, but um, she is an Academy Award nominee. She started a, uh, two different media collaboratives, um, helped uh, Democracy Now! move from radio to television. And um, thank you so much for being here, Dee Dee. Well, I, I, am, I love Vermont, and I've spent a lot of time here. And I've always admired uh, the way that, uh, for example, Chittenden County TV in Burlington mm -hmm. has it's been VK, run. Right? Uh, Lauren Glenn Davidian is an old friend, and she was actually on the board of Deep Dish uh -huh. when, when we were starting. And uh, the idea of Deep Dish was to connect up all the different public accesses around the country and share programming. And, and we always have had programming from Vermont Excellent. on Deep Dish. That's been something I've noticed that our, our public access channels tend to be little islands and creating those connections so that there's sort of a shared culture is, uh, you saw that need years ago and built something to address it, huh? Well, also to, to sh we, what we would do is we would take shows about specific subjects so exam and to show that the issues that a lot of the access producers were addressing were weren't just local issues for example housing there was uh, one of our program first series we did was on housing and how there were homeless in Los Angeles but also homeless in Chicago and mm -hmm. Philly and different people had made tapes about them. So we used both access tapes and independent producer tapes, little segments, but it was a way of kind of reconstituting and, and kind of clarifying the, uh, what, what could be a local issue to see that it's a national problem. Right, so you could structure around themes yeah. and then draw connections right. throughout the country. That's, I mean, that is a really good analysis of, of, of what public access needs and then applying yeah. a solution. So thank you for that. And there was also a, a, a kind of exchange of techniques too because Paper Tiger had started before Deep Dish and founded Deep Dish actually and we were trying to use public access as a kind of artistic medium like television, like how how can we utilize the fact that it's live, that there are like all these creative people who are involved, mm -hmm. and how can we change the whole culture of television? So right. a lot of our programs were very kind of experimental in terms of the art, and in the art world sort of noticed that, and we had exhibits in the Whitney Museum and the Wexner Center and various places around, uh, around the, uh, country in the world actually people picked them up we were there was a paper tiger exhibit in Rotterdam and in uh, France and so excellent it, it, we were doing really cutting-edge television so and you could work around the corporate gatekeepers um, because you had um, access to what was even more expensive and not so ubiquitous technology um, yeah then. it's it, yeah, actually, it was interesting because uh, there was th that was a time when editing was very when we first started it, to actually own an editing machine. You couldn't edit on computer at all, mm -hmm. so it was all analog editing, which need to do it well. You needed to have, ex which is one reason that I think public access w was utilized as a space where people could come to get access to equipment. Right, and speaking of editing, I just pulled you away from editing with Jerome, who's one yeah. of our excellent <laughs> uh, producers here locally, 
And what are you working on? And uh, maybe a little bit about your relationship with Bread and Puppet also. Well, uh, I've, I've I made a, the first film I made with Bread and Puppet is called Meadows Green, and that was done in 1974. And actually, um, that Museum of Modern Art just bought it, actually, huh. and they restored it. And uh, so we have, wow. it was done in 16 millimeter. But I'll make sure that Orca gets a really high. You, it that was we can such show. a different, yeah, for sure. Thank it's you. Uh, it, it was actually they were right up the road here. They were in Plainfield at right, the time. Right, right, and they're in at Glover Kate now. Farm, yeah, and now they're up in Glover. So I've had a long relationship with them. And this summer, my husband died in April. Um, who was Joel Covell was one of the founders of the eco-socialist movement, and hmm. he, um, they, we decided to memorialize him at the theater because he loved the theater, and um, and so we had a seminar to kind of toss around a lot of his ideas, and friends Beautiful. of his came, and so Jerome did this marvelous job of filming the whole thing, which I didn't really expect. <laughs> That, and he, it was just amazing. So we have both, because uh, I was taping it also. So we have the two cameras, and uh, and we're we're doing a little You're edit. You're blending the right two now. Things. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't know how he does it because Bread and Puppet shows are such a live theater experience. He somehow captures it on I, video, yeah. and that's not easy to do. I was real. I think it's his long theater t t uh, experience because he worked with the living theater for uh -huh. many years to know where the but shots he, would be. Well, but also the drama and the tension and right. the, and the way he zooms out at just the right moment. It's like he anticipates um, that moment when you uh, they're going to open their arms, and he he has an instinct that is. Very unusual, and I think he's. It. I don't. I was really pleasantly surprised because I've seen. I know a lot of people come with their iPhones to tape Bread and Puppet, but not in the professional yeah. way that Jerome Yeah, did. I'm guilty yeah. of that myself. Yeah. And I was like, boy, that did not <laughs> capture the experience at all. Um, so we will actually be able to. That will actually be broadcast on yeah. on Orca when it's when it's done and it's getting close, huh? Right. Excellent. Um, we probably ought to shift to this, uh, these monumental times we live in and how you continue to interact with the, I guess it's the cutting edge of media and law right now. Um, so you have been working in New York City with um, their access center is known as Manhattan Neighborhood, Neighborhood Network. Network. Here, from here out we'll say MNN, I guess that's yeah. what the... Um, the uh, briefs and all the legal documents say, and then it's um, Halleck, and you have a partner. Uh, my friend is Papaletto, uh, Jesus Papaletto Melendez, who's a Puerto Rican poet, and he's also kind of the unofficial mayor of the barrio because he's one of the, every year they have a Three Kings pageant. Okay. And he's, uh, he's always one of the kings. and. He's, uh, one year he rode on a camel. <laughs> so they have a big parade because the Latinos celebrate um, Christmas on the 5th of, or 6th of July. The Three Kings come that night. The Epiphany, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's when kids get their presents. And uh, um, so he, they have a big parade every year. and. Uh, Papa Led was part of it, so he he was working at uh, on, at Union Settlement doing a class with seniors and and teenagers. A very interesting kind of mix of those two ages. Actually, mm -hmm. it was uh, that was actually funded by Manhattan Neighborhood Network. In the past, there were these grants, community media grants. So um, the current director. When he came on, he cut those grants off. So the original problem started when all of a sudden Papaletto didn't have a job because they cut the grants. Right. So a group of us also who were also grantees 
they there was uh, M and N has a very big budget. They have, they get nine million dollars a year. They get from Time Warner. Right. They get sort of a Spectrum. quarterly check, maybe at around five percent of the cable. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. similar to us with Comcast. But, you but guys our don't scale get is nine scale's a little different. Million. Welcome to <laughs> exactly. welcome to Mafia. Um, uh, but they it's also Verizon. So. He, oh, he okay. was able to negotiate a, a contract to get lots of money. So, part so we wanted that, those, those grants. So he had cut them off while they were negotiating. Those grants, I mean, part of our mission is to you know, educate the public into how to use and produce, um, you know, use media equipment to produce narratives. So that, that, those grants were targeting that aspect of the of the mission is that he was working with the, the elderly yeah, and well, teens the, on the idea the reason they gave the grants to nonprofit community groups was to get the money out of the center because the center there was only at that time there was only one um, studio and that was on 59th street and a lot of neighborhood people they they don't go out of their Milia, right. and, and so the idea was if you gave bring money it, to different to the groups, sure, yeah. then and train people there, then they can make programming that can be put on. So there was uh, Paper Tiger got grants, and Deep Dish got grants, and the Asian Cinevision got grants, and so a it's lot a way of to different groups. Disperse exactly. access in a large city so that you wouldn't have to come to 59th Street, that right. one physical location. So we got, so we went, we tried, we, we had a friend who was on the board and we decided we would go to the board meeting because we read the bylaws, which at that point were posted on the web. They're no longer posted okay. on the web. But the bylaws said that the board meetings are public. So we went to the board meeting and then we were told we couldn't be part of it, that, it was a, that they have closed meetings. So. So you and were hoping to uh, make the case to reinstitute the grant program, right? Oh, gotcha. And so the next morning, Papoletto was told that he couldn't come to the studio anymore, and that he was uh, because he went to the board meeting. And so Papoletto, so we went to, uh, we decided. Well, they're opening the 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 center, so we went. Papa went to the center and a second studio. N yeah, a new, studio a new studio up in the barrio, which he was very excited about because it was in his neighborhood. Uh -huh. And so I went there and I filmed Papo talking about that they wouldn't let him in and that he was. Right. It's a funny tape. It's on YouTube. It's called the One Percent Visits the Barrio, because all the people who came were the architects and the politicians but mm -hmm. the local people weren't invited it was to invitation this opening. Only. yeah so Gala. so we so but it's Pablo talking about it and I thought well I'll put this on Manhattan neighborhood network and right, I, I put public it on station. which they have to put on it's first come first serve and they put it on without previewing it right but and they, that's getting into the, the case, <laughs> exactly, the First Amendment issue. Is, they were good news preview, yes. And then they said that because I had made the tape, um, that it, and it, they they interpreted one of the sentences as being threatening, and that uh, that I I was banned from doing anything from coming into the studio mm -hmm. or putting any tapes on or anything, and. And so both physically banned from the space and your access to the it, channel, channel. Produce, showing exactly. your produced materials exactly. to the channel was also. So I was like, wait a minute, you can't do that. It's like um, I was one of the founders of m and right. and I feel that I was not threat. If Papo wasn't, th first of all, it was Papo saying that. It wasn't me saying it. That's a whole other thing. If, if somebody records somebody saying if he was threatening. Right. Even so, I shouldn't the have been banned. The reporter's so, responsibility there is not, so those words it, weren't coming out of your mouth, right? Yeah. So anyway, I was banned, and but I what hit me most was that Papa was banned forever, and this was in his neighborhood, and mm -hmm. he felt really upset about it. So we decided that we would. We and I had a friend who was a lawyer, Robert Perry, who had taken another 
case to the Supreme Court, the Denver area case. Oh, which, that's like mid '90s. Yes, and it seems as though from the the writing now, there's some unresolved issues from that case. Exactly. Um, so let's let's catch people up a little bit. Um, you're coming off a win. The Second Circuit covers the New York City area, and they determined that. Um, you were, in fact, denied your First Amendment rights. Yeah, we, well, first we went to the, I guess, the local court or whatever. And District, then, maybe. And we, it was, the, actually, it was interesting. The judge basically said that he couldn't decide so that we should go to the Second Circuit. Oh. So we ended up in the Second Circuit. And so um, that there, he said there were unresolved issues. And so we went up into the Second Circuit and... Judge Newman, who's an older guy who um, was a, a Carter appointee, actually, okay. and he was very, um, he, he, he watched the tape, he said, uh, in the, uh, the transcript says, I watched that tape and I didn't see anything threatening about it, which was interesting as I didn't either see anything threatening. Um, so. And, and he said um, that, that, but their defense had been that they could, they could censor because they were a private entity, a private a, a nonprofit, nonprofit I would assume, right? And that they, um, and that that, that 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 public access is not a public forum. That was right. in their brief, right? And 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 Judge Newman said no public access is a public forum that that's what it's set up to be and so we were really happy and we were thinking we would now go back to Eminem we could negotiate and and Pablo could have a show mm -hmm. he had all kinds of plans to do a poetry series and whatever and we were thinking everything was resolved and then we found out that they were appealing and the only appeal is There's to the Supreme Court. There's nowhere to go but Court. the Supreme Court. So there's one piece we ought to clarify here is that uh, the First Amendment says the government shall not you know, make laws right. that um, censor individuals. And the public access station is saying, well, we're not the government. And there's this whole body of law about who is an agent of the state um, who is who? Who sometimes falls into governmental functions, basically, and that seems to be the core. The the core of, of, issue. What, of how the Supreme Court took it. I think that they they could have taken. There were other issues involved, but that seems to be the core at this point. Um, but if you look at things like if a developer comes, a private developer, and develops a a, a, a housing area the, and puts in roads, sure. those roads have to b adhere to local, to the, to the rules and have to be accessible to all. Right. So we were thinking that it was like a, um, a kind of par like a public park that um, you, it may be government but it's, uh, or it may be a private entity that actually develops it, but the, it seemed to me that the, pub, the whole reason of having public access, which is in exchange for the rights of way, the actual digging up the streets or the telephone poles that um, it caused uh, either problems for the city or, uh, or take up uh, space on the roads or whatever, that 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 it's that's what the payback is that they give you a channel and they right. there's the five percent, but also the that from from the very beginning it has been tied to some obligation that you provide a public forum and um, and actually the Manhattan Neighborhood Network um, their their handbook and also their website says that their mission and it's in their bylaws their mission is to to uh, to assist the public to um, exercise their first amendment rights so
That's right. what we were trying to do. <laughs> right. So it, it seems as though um, MNN's lawyers in petitioning the Supreme Court to see if they'd take it up was arguing that the Second Circuit was so broad in its interpretation of what a public forum is that it could affect uh, social media. The, it, does Facebook have a quasi-governmental function? And um, I, I, Trump's Twitter account, is that a public forum? Can he ban someone from you know, following him? And yeah. There are all these issues, there's all these larger issues that MNN's lawyers are saying you know, if you, if you follow the Second Circuit, you're going to open up a whole can of worms in terms of community moderation yeah. on all kinds of forums. And then um, the briefs on your side are saying, actually, this is a very narrow yeah. um, situation. New York law specifically has a, a first come, first serve right. rule. It's not about the content. It's just, you know, whoever shows up, it's kind of an open field. So I don't know. I don't know if you've sort of lately had to well, become a know, legal scholar <laughs> and, and digest all these complicated issues, but I'm, I'm I'm really fascinated by the the back and forth. Well, it turns out what we, I don't think the lawyers saw that coming. Actually, even M and N's lawyers saw. What happened was there was another case where t uh, Trump tried to close off some people who had um, who had critiqued him on Twitter after his his and there was it was a legal case I and and they cited our victory in the Second Circuit as a reason <laughs> that they so all of a sudden it opened up this floodgate to say oh my gosh this case is affecting um, not just <laughs> public access, right. but Twitter, Facebook, okay. anything. So it, and we're saying, wait a minute. <laughs> like, you, how was that case found? That there were people that said Trump can't um, stop us from following him That or is still working its way oh, it up still to is, the case. I mean, okay. we're, t that's one thing I have, that's been a rude awakening to me, that just how slow the law sure. is. Because our case started in 2011. Right. So huh. that's seven years that we've been dealing. Well, that was when we first tried to go to the board meeting, and mm -hmm. it's been like a long time. So, so that's that's it, a, a great idea to timeline this out again. You experienced the the victory of Second Circuit in the early spring, maybe. Yeah. And then uh, the petitioners are MNN, the appealers, uh, put in basically pitched the idea to the Supreme Court. Hey, we think there are significant First Amendment issues yeah. here. And they picked it up just last week or the You know, the thing was in October we, of twenty eight. We were so right? we were shocked that it was picked up because it, only one case out of a thousand that get brought up to the Supreme Court is ever They have to see a really considered. significant constitutional and, issue <laughs> That and, is and, unresolved. And, and our lawyer said, "Oh, it'll never happen." But uh -huh. we'll, you know, we and we didn't even put in any amicus briefs because we were hoping to. We we were happy with right. the Second Circus decision, right. and we didn't need to, sure. you know, rock Just the boat. Just lean on their but decision. But they is got the, logic, the Cato Institute, which is a right-wing think tank, which is a, that behind a, the Citizens Liberty. United case, right? Yes, and the Cato Institute is the Koch brothers. So mm -hmm. it's um, it's you know it, 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 they're very they have very deep pockets, and right. so. Uh, and I just have this one lawyer who's worked very hard on this case, and, and for pro, pro bono, I haven't paid him anything. And uh, it's uh, it's it's we're up against these giants. Huh. So once again, it's David and Goliath. <laughs> <laughs> so the timeline going forward is they'll they'll hear it this year, maybe in the yeah, winter. They, well, what we heard is that. They have to have their amicus briefs in by um, by by the by no, by Thanksgiving by November. Okay, 26. and that's like fr friends of either side can yeah. throw in their opinions. Right. Okay. And our response to their uh, positions 
have to be, uh, we get 30 days after that. So that would be December. So actually, but then the case will pro won't probably be adjudicated until like June, something like that. Right. So um, the, th I think there's replies or something that may go in, but, sure. but, but we're hoping t that we would get some amicus briefs from people who, who have loved and feel the value of public access, which is really uh, enormous important I feel it's it's wonderful being here at work I must say there is a lot of activity because it's election time yes that too. and that is so important because you know I, I turned on the the television in the motel and all I get is Burlington news there's very little local news mm -hmm. and thank God for Orca giving these, uh, have, being able to attend the candidates' forums and stuff for all the different uh, candidates. It's, uh, it, what, what are we going to do without public access? Right, it's, it's crucial. Yeah. yeah. And I guess I think there is some trepidation in the public access world that what is this particular Supreme Court as configured um, potentially going to do with um, this case, so we'll see. It must be pins and needles. You're, it's basically in early summer they usually roll out their opinions, right? Well, and also there's there's a lot of fear in the public access community because, for example, um, the FCC is also putting pressure on, and it w there's a feeling. P a Pi, who's the yeah, IG Pi has yeah, and he's not a friend of of democratic communications. Right. He's very in the pocket so of the a, corporations. I mean, he's, a, he's a Verizon corporate lawyer. Yeah. Previously, our um, executive director Rob Chapman let us know that he is um, directing his staff to look at counting. Um, the actual channel space that public access has as an in-kind donation to the public right. access channel and so they could put a price tag on it and then the check the channel would get to actually run the channel would go down to zero or below zero right. so um, see there's a there's a law that says five percent is the maximum that, mm -hmm. uh, that the cable companies can be required to? Some com some cities don't even get the five percent. Right. But but um, but the the thing is that the the FCC has a rulemaking now that says that it can be in kind, and that could be anything that they de deem it, uh, right that can count right. for right. the five percent, right. which is really ridiculous. So. Um, I know our viewers know the value of public access, yeah. and um, we'll we'll just we'll just have to wait and see here. Yeah. As um, so, I, it's it's strange because so many norms in the last couple of years have been up, uh, you know, unhinged. That's that you know what was formerly unthinkable is now like, is that possible? Could there be some ruling where, um, and it probably wouldn't be. A single big ruling would probably be a chip away, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the danger. So it's very it's people precarious. Are, yeah, people recognize the value of, of, of what you've done and what Orca does. Um, it may be, we'll see, we'll see. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah. If it's, they may, ah, we'll, we'll just have to find out. Yeah. Um, now, now but we are getting, we're going to get an amicus brief from the American Civil Liberties Union. Excellent and other organizations and now by adding the we I, I haven't yet talked to but there is a number of organizations that deal with the n social media or the internet like epic and um, okay the C consumer federation so there yeah there could Those. be a whole swath of issues that they yeah. they have to contend with yeah it's so amazing it's um, now in a supreme court situation you're not called to the stand it's just lawyers, lawyers talking yeah. to the justices explaining yeah. how they yeah. see the constitution so that yeah. you're behind you're you're <laughs> behind that all of that type of um, 
uh, visits to court are, are over for you. Now it's just kind but of. But we're hoping to be able to make to have some press about it. I think. The, yeah, the, yeah. The, I, I appreciate you doing this. Oh well, program. this. Is, I mean, I our our the audience. People need our to audience find is out. going to be up to speed yeah. when this. I I think it'll make some news in June, but it'll yeah. probably hit people like, what was that about? Yeah. So now we actually have a nice grounding yeah. on the facts of the case and the constitutional issues. Yeah. So thanks so much for making the time. Well, thank you and for we're, covering we're this. We're beyond issue. time. And uh, it's been a real joy talking with you. And uh, have fun with the rest of your stay in Vermont and, um, and editing. We're looking forward to seeing um, the results of your visit. Okay. Um, night, everyone. <laughs>